Awesome. So, uh, and then please feel free to jump in. So a little bit about my background. I, I have multiple devices. Um, I have 17 laptops and tablets in my gym now. I have probably, I went through my background of, I'm roughly, I would say I'm getting close to a million dollars worth of equipment. Um, probably 200,000 I bought myself were things that the school just wouldn't buy. So I bought it myself, my own education. So I've I've done well more than a half a million biological experiments. And that could just be from performing one, one little exercise in test and retest. So um, I oversaw 12 different teams one year, that was 20 years ago for about a decade. So I, I wrote 27 strength programs a month for a decade of my life. And this is how I got my programming and triphasic training all came to fruition. So, um, and then, you know, one of the biggest things that, that came about seven, eight years ago is I actually uh, was uh, talking with a coach and he was telling me about some stuff with one of, uh, that he'd seen and one of my assistants had some major problems. And I think it was from brain trauma over the years and multiple concussions. And they're just things we couldn't fix with exercise. And he worked on this assistant of mine and he was like, well, and, and he literally fixed problems that I'd never seen fixed before when I say that. And uh, it was basically RPR at the time. So I was going to fly to South Africa. Douglas Hill um, was the guy teaching the course at the time. And he was like, uh, and go see Douglas. So, but fortunately Douglas has come to Chicago. Lo and behold, this is where I met Chris Corfus and, and Douglas is a part of RPR, but RPR was able to fix like some crazy amazing things in regards to uh, athletes with compensation patterns. And people talk to me about compensation patterns. And, and when I say compensation patterns, basically what I'm talking about is, is if you're, if you're not firing your, your hip flexor correctly, then what is doing the hip flexor's job? And basically it becomes your quad sometimes could be other things. Um, I'll share my, my slides now and uh here we go slide share bam and we'll go okay and uh, can everybody see that fully yeah. okay fast fabulous so here's the biggest thing was you that you can click play also yeah i was gonna maybe share it uh, full size but here was the biggest thing that i've seen over the years oh that's not it uh Oh, wrong one. There we go. So here was the biggest thing is that when an athlete walks in to my gym with RPR, I was able to identify that he's got a quad dominance problem. And, and I knew this before, but, and then I start squatting this athlete and guess who gets blamed for the quad, the, the tightness and the knee pain I do, but I'm not the cause. The kid brought this compensation pattern in what are ways that a coach can figure out if they got compensation if they don't know RPR? Um, years ago, I figured out that I had kids that would stand on a force plate and they would jump up and down, but you don't need a force plate. You just put them on a line. You have them jump up and down, hands on hips with their eyes closed. And if they start sneaking forward, they're using their quads to jump. And what you'll see when that athlete runs, let's say um, runs down the uh, track, and I've actually just noticed it in a lot of other drills that I've picked up, but uh, everyone knows what Deion Sanders, you know, does everyone, when I say that, that straight legged Deion run, when he goes to score a touchdown, he's running straight legged, you know, kind of like, um, I've saw those athletes with quad dominance jump up more than the other athletes. So if I have them do that, your athletes with the quad dominant problem will definitely, uh, jump up more so these are just compensations that I'm talking about as a coach that I that sometimes coaches will get blamed for but it's not my problem the athlete brought this problem in so this was the one big thing now one of the biggest changes and physiology wise is actually happens in the front side but for performance wise happens on the back side and there are some and I'll clear up some maybe some controversy about this but for actual hip extension, the most optimal athletes I've ever seen, and we're talking world Olympic champions, have this pattern working correctly. Um, and, I'll, and I'll clarify some of the science, in my opinion, is that this glute right here fires first with hip extension. 
then this hamstring has to fire correctly right after it. And then for balance of the body and the differentiation between upper and lower, this contralateral QL, I'm sorry, this contralateral QL is what stabilizes the upper body helps. And then you can, you, you have this whole sling that runs through the upper body. We're not going to get into that today, but this is an optimal pattern. And the second I can get somebody to this pattern, they've always ran faster and jumped higher. So for example, and I'm using, I'll use a quad since I, but on the front side, if they're a quad dominant person, a lot of times they won't have this glute pattern either. They'll actually have a hamstring pattern, which is this one right here. Okay. But my point to you is that if I can get this pattern corrected and the quad dominance pattern corrected on the front side, my track athletes eight years ago, guess what happened to them? Their quads got smaller and they ran faster and jumped higher because we took the compensation patterns out. The, the best athletes in the world are the best compensators. So this is the, the first. So again, this is the correct pattern. Glute, same side, hamstring, contralateral QL in general. This pattern, and I've, I've checked this with EMGs. I'll, I'll actually show you a quick way on a, a YouTube video I have and I'll share to check this pattern to see if your athletes have the right pattern, okay? So with that being said, what happens is they fire their hamstring first and then they fire their QL and then they fire their glute. This is an implosion of force. Follow me because the hamstring fires and then the forces go into the hip versus on the correct one previously, the glute fires and the forces run out the limb and then run through the ground. So you're applying more optimal forces and you're not gonna break because eventually folks, what, what I saw, this person breaks. Now, what, if, if this person's running a 400 per se and they start to fatigue, what tightens up? The hamstring is a sure indicator that they tighten up. The other pattern starts at a QL their lower back locks up if they're in, which is the next pattern I have. So this hamstring tightens up. Um, I've seen wide, uh, wide stance powerlifting drive this pattern home. I'm not a big fan of the wide stance powerlifting. I'm not even a fan of the, um, too much of the Olympic style back squat. Okay. It's better than the wide stance, but that pattern has a tendency to drive home this hip extension pattern. Okay. Now, People talk about, well, we do, um, well, let me get to the third pattern, then we'll, we'll talk about kind of what fixes it. And, and here's the conundrum. I know people think, okay, so if I do 20,000 hip extension patterns a day with a hamstring driving, driving this hip extension pattern, this hamstring becomes tight and irritated, and a lot of times people want to stretch it the wrong way. All right, and we, I, I would hope this group knows uh, the feeling on stretching that we have, obviously, I have anyway. But the point is, is that hamstrings weren't really made for walking. They're made for running, in my opinion. That's when they're most optimally used. And the point is, is that when, when this engages during hip extension, you're using it for walking all day long, and that becomes a problem. What, is, what other conversations have I seen with tight hamstrings? I've seen obviously the tight lower back, but also the calf muscles become tight. These are tied together 100% of the time, okay? So um, that's the first bad hamstring pattern. Now the most dangerous one, or, or the most dangerous hip extension pattern, now there's basically only three, is this little QL muscle, caudoris labratum, fires, and then the hamstring, and then the glute. You could see how this is, 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 is an implosion of force again, right? So what we have here is very dangerous. What I've seen over the years is this, actually you guys can check it right now. If you feel your ribs right here, the bottom of your ribs, and then you sneak down to the top of your hip bone, you should actually have four fingers in that gap, okay? If you don't have four fingers in that gap, there's a compensation pattern. Now, what happens is that this lower back actually initiates hip extension, then the hamstring, and then the glutes, 
okay? So, and this is the, one of the major things that RPR kind of instantly switches over to somebody. So one of the examples I'll use, I had a six foot five athlete leave me. He was a $25 million athlete at the time. Now he's worth more. His lower rib and his hip, oops, I'm sorry, his hip bone was five fingers apart. Okay. He starts skating with his team in training and I'll probably go on a rant here folks, but here's what I've seen core bracing do. I've seen an athlete in my gym with a great pattern right here, the normal pattern. We've experimented on multiple people, brace their core the way they're coached to, and they instantly go from a healthy glute pattern to the incorrect glute pattern. I never believed in 20 years core bracing was, was the correct thing to do. Why? I just tested it. I had every one of my athletes run a 20 yard dash and a 40 yard dash bracing their core. Guess what? Every time got slower. I had all my athletes brace their glutes and do a bench press and 100 over 100 athletes checked. I, then I had them brace their core. Guess what happened to the bar speed? It slows down. Okay. People forget that the core, which I'm going to circle right here, is actually connected to the hips. The hip is the foundation of everything, okay? All my high performers, hips function correctly. Why are, and even my baseball pitchers, I had some 90 some mile an hour athletes that throw the ball 90 miles an hour, lost seven to eight miles per hour when they braced their core when they tried to pitch. So my question was always, why do we do core bracing? It actually screws up the muscle patterns. We, you, what happens in my opinion, folks, if these hips are in the right function correctly, the core braces itself exactly how fast it's supposed to. And I'll get into that. Now, this, this six foot five hockey player went to a place where they braced their core. That's all they taught them. Even when they skate. Four months later, I saw him on TV, texted him, was like, you have a problem, major problem. He had this skating pattern. I can actually, nowadays, I can see these patterns when people move. I know what their problem is. And I said, you have a major problem. We got to get you fixed up. I can send somebody. I can't do it myself. He says, okay. Two weeks later, he texts me. He's like, it's too late. I'm like, what? He's like, I just blew my back out. And long story short, when he came to see me before surgery, his top hip bone Instead of four fingers between the top hip bone and the hip rib, he actually had five. The top hip bone had tucked inside his hips. And he lost two inches off his height. I've seen this pattern cause these problems all the time. Now, people say, well, we activate our glutes. All these glute activation exercises, and I can, I'll post a video in the chat about it. I've actually checked them. I've never seen one glute activation exercise fix this pattern. Even if you get it right, this pattern, if this is what you normally have in your daily gait, will not be changed. Let's say in the weight room, you do 60 glute exercises that you actually get it right. And then you do your exercises in the weight room that you actually get the pattern right. But you, your athlete goes and walks 3,000 steps or 10,000 that day with this, you erase everything that you did that was good. Um, there was my ran on core bracing. So people ask me, well, how do I, how do I work my core? You need to squeeze your glutes first and then the right pattern comes into place and then you work your ab muscles. Okay. So if somebody's going to come to me and they're going to push me, I actually have to brace my glutes if I'm standing before I can brace my core. So I think we look at, I'm going to be honest with you. I think we will look at sports performance the wrong way. We still have to realize it's survival. So when people talk about survival, the brain, the body will, will protect the brain first and its eyes. This is our natural reaction because it's the brain's inside the skull. The eyes are outside the skull. They're still part of the brain. Then the second most important thing on that level is the spine. So when people talk about the core, they're actually talking about these spinal erectors. Okay, these things only function correctly if this hip pattern is correct in this firing sequence. This is crazy. We just caught this. This glute med muscle right here 
if it is not working correctly for hip stability, lateral movement, everything that, that has to do in my eyes with balance, the opposite erector in every one of my athletes was completely locked down, completely locked down. So if I check your glute med muscle and I'll, all I'm, when I say that, I'm just laying the athlete down. I'm at their legs. I grab their feet. They lift their leg out. They're holding and they're on their back. They're trying to hold their, their leg out while I just bring it to the midline. And if they have no strength, this glute med muscle is off, which guarantees me if this has happened within the last couple of weeks, after about two or three weeks, this will actually start to lock down their entire spine on the opposite side. Why? This is the only way that spine can stabilize. Remember, this is the second thing in the pecking order of survival is the spine. So people talk about, hey, um, you have to think survival and not performance. So when an athlete doesn't have a glute med, what happens? The track coaches, if, if they know what the main problem is, will see that this leg, instead of going straight up and down when the athlete runs, will sneak more to the midline of the body. So when you're behind an athlete and you see them, and that right foot sneaks into the midline, this glute med is not working correctly, okay? Now, here's the, the craziest part about high-level RPR. I'm telling you, 90% of the time, that glute med's not working correctly because they have an arch problem. And I will send that to you guys how to fix it. The, when their foot strikes the ground, the arch collapses enough, the brain will go, I can't stabilize my foot. I can't stabilize at the knee. I actually have to go to the hip and start locking certain things down, which then doesn't allow the glute med to do its real job, which is complete stability. So the second I can get, and, and look, if you have an athlete that you test with that, and, and I'll actually send this to you guys on YouTube so you have to follow up. But if I test, if they're laying on their back and their feet are with me, and I test that, they, they pull their leg out to the side, and I grab their ankle and I pull it in. And if it's super weak, 90% of the time, they have an arch problem, which has caused the hip instability problem. Now, how do we fix that in RPR? I basically go from the, the top of the calf right here. It's about a two inch um, period spot where you dig in from the top of the calf in the midline to the inside to the head of the tibia, where you're just digging in as hard as you can. And I'm not kidding you, you go retest that and it makes it completely strong. I have force plate studies. I didn't do the study, I just test. I don't do studies anymore. I just test, make sure I'm getting exactly what I need. But this will help reset and turn on that glute med muscle. Is the, I call it an arch reset in RPR. This is what we do. And then once they walk around a bit or indoor run, guess what happens to this erector? It loosens up. Because now the survival mechanism isn't, it says I'm stable. I don't have to lock down this erector on the opposite side to make sure I'm keeping the spine healthy and safe, okay? Because when people talk about core, what they're really talking about, in my opinion, that they don't get is this, this spine and how, is, how this spine stabilizes everything. Because it, it doesn't matter if you have abs or not. Your body doesn't care. It only cares that it protects this erector, okay? So with this, again, if I can get this athlete to change this pattern, okay? Now, I'm going to tell you right now how I do it in exercise. And I tried, before I learned RPR, I had a way, but it wasn't as permanent as RPR. So Everyone can do this if you guys don't want to do it right now. But what I, I show people is we, we'll actually do an RPR or a, a RDL, I'm sorry. And we have our toes pointed up, right? We'll do a couple RDLs just to give them a feel. And then the next one, we actually have them go down and we squeeze our big toe. So I squeeze my big toe into the ground when I go to do hip extension. And you can find and you'll feel that your glute turns on and this pattern gets fixed. With every hip extension pattern, you need to take your big toe and squeeze it into the ground as hard as you can. Did you guys feel your glutes turn on? Fabulous, yes. Now, here's the catch. Why, why is this pattern not working in most people? I think it's shoes. 
your shoes shut down that reflex. Because if you were walking around, you would actually have to grab, the big toe grabs the ground and helps propel you forward with the, the right hip extension pattern, okay? Flip-flops, folks, think about flip-flops. When you walk and you have to lift your toe up to hold the flip-flop on, that's ruining this pattern. I have had kids leave my gym and go on vacation for two weeks and wore flip-flops and came back with the wrong pattern, okay? That's, that's the crazy thing about this. So when do I do this? Look, I, every, every squat that we do, on the way up, we squeeze the big toe. It's called the Babinski reflex. Does everybody know when, when babies are born, they will check, they will scratch the toe or the bottom of their foot to make sure the toe squeezes. They're actually checking the glute, okay? So in exercise, that's how I fix it. So every, everything we do, even if it's a pull-up, we squeeze, we curl the toe, we squeeze the glute, and we do a pull-up. Why? Because if I was going to pull something in nature, my glute, if I'm standing, my glute has to stabilize my entire body, and then I can pull somebody or pull something. So people think those kipping pull-ups might be bad. It's actually the real pattern that your body wants to perform with, okay? Um, when we bench, we squeeze our toes into the ground, which causes our butt to fire, which then allows the bar to move faster. 100% of the time, okay? So every exercise that I do from core training, we definitely do the, uh, we squeeze the toe. Now, here's how we fix it with RPR. Um, when I was talking, there's two spots to turn those glutes on with RPR, okay? Um, I believe, uh, let me, mm, well, I can just show you. So the first one, is right behind the jaw. So if I'm right under my ear, if I go right behind the jaw and I was kind of gonna like fish hook myself and I get right behind my jaw and I dig into that tender spot right, right behind the jawbone. So I'm pushing against my jawbone right here underneath my ear. It's really tender and I just circle it and I push in and kind of make it really uncomfortable. So if you're looking at me, I'm, I'm like this. This will actually, Take that pattern and make it correct, okay? Now, the next one is basically the, the ridge of the skull. So right underneath your skull, you're going to go – let me just make sure I'm in – yep, I'm in camera view. You're going to go and go from the middle of the skull, right at the bottom of the neck, and go all the way underneath your, your entire skull along the ridge. And you're just going like this, and you're just rubbing it back and forth, probably in one inch movements, don't pull your hair out, okay? And these are fascia resets. These are neural lymphatic reset that will ingrain that pattern, okay? And literally, we've picked it up on EMGs. We've picked it up jumping higher, running faster. These are, and that's a set. Now, people ask us, why, why behind the skull to turn the glute on? We think it comes back to the primal stuff when you're, how you develop in your baby. So your first extension pattern, which the glute obviously is an extension pattern, is to root for food as a baby. This is why we feel, so those muscles underneath your neck, right behind the, the jaw, is your first hip extension pattern, or is your first extension pattern. So this is why we think that behind the skull turns the glute on. The second extension pattern you do is to open your mouth to eat. And that's why we believe the one behind the jaw is associated with hip extension pattern. So, um, gosh, I'm a little bit um, lost on um, it, the, the, the PT's name that did all the work with the, the kids in the Eastern blocks. But um, this is, you know, this is where we believe it comes from. This is the, basically the foundational part of uh, – all these reflexes, and this is why that's where we think it's at. So how long does RPR last? Let's say you do that. I've had athletes that last weeks, months. If you have an injury, let's say you injure your ankle, it shuts down your glute, it, and then you could turn it on for three or four hours. So during a game, I got a kid that takes a puck into the knee or the foot, 
glute shut off. He'll RPR again to turn the glute on. And it'll last three or four hours, but eventually the pain shuts it off. The brain goes, I got to override this because the pain's too great. So um, I can show you some of the crazy causes. So like, for example, this is not me. Um, we have a breathing reset. This was not my coach. Uh, well, here, here's an example. I have one of my three-time Olympians. She did this bike workout. She basically did 160 beats per minute. And this was her standard bike workout. The first day she tried RPR, she, that same bike workout with the same watts, if she was tired, she'd be 165. If she felt good, maybe 158. Her resting heart rate is at 148, doing the same workout, okay? Um, the biggest thing about RPR, especially the breathing reset, which I'll get to, is that it causes a parasympathetic, a, a parasympathetic shift. And if everybody, I think most people probably know that here, but it just is, is your system to recover and relax. So we had an army ranger with PTSD. He only slept in two hour intervals. He'd wake up, try to go back to sleep, back and forth, struggle for three, uh, I think it was for, for three years. He did his RPR. He slept 13 hours the first night. So most of our athletes don't have this problem, but an athlete that is, sympathetic driven that is always wound tight that is training a lot if you do heart rate variability tests they'll be more sympathetic if they're breathing the correct way they become parasympathetic and the one thing about all these breathing exercises people talk about is how to do them and, and all this is great but what rpr does is we actually release all the fascia in the tissue we're the only group that does a mechanical part of that and and basically um and I'm definitely going to show you guys. I'll just show you exactly. We call it the upside down Y. Uh, uh, let me go real quick. I thought I had that up. Um, real quick. So with the upside down Y, let me bring this thing over here. I just want to give you a good graphic of it just so you can see it. So basically here it is. So you can see, uh, let me peel this off, get it out of your way. I'm sorry I had that. So this upside down Y, what, what, you do here basically is you take your finger and you start at the top of the diaphragm and in one inch intervals, you're just going one inch at a time, moving your skin back and forth. I would say the resistance is about as much as you would push against your hand till your hand starts to push back like a, like a stake. And then you're just rubbing this area all the way down to the bottom of the sternum. And then what you do is you find your ribs and you rub right along the edge of the ribs, just off the edge. I call it a cliffhanger. And you go down about five or six inches. And when we do that, we also recommend that you're breathing. And how we recommend you breathe when you are uh, doing RPR is you breathe in through your nose and out your mouth. I recommend that when you're doing RPR. At rest, you should breathe in and out your mouth or in and out your nose your entire life. That's what we tell people. Heart rate variability readings are much better. Recovery causes nitrous oxide. A ton of my athletes, I have them breathe with their, their uh, sleep with their mouth tape shut at night. Why? Because they're mouth breathers. So if you breathe, if you wake up in the morning with dry breath, with a dry mouth, you are mouth breathing too much. Okay. You're mouth breathing and you're not getting full recovery. Your heart rate var variability is bad. The ability to recover is lessened. You wake up in a sympathetic state. Okay. So that, um, I would say you probably spend about a minute the first time you're doing this. A and the biggest thing with RPR, what we do is we're releasing all this fascia and this is a neural lymphatic uh, flush reset and all this tissue starts to loosen up. So um, after a Couple, a few RPR sessions where the athlete have done it themselves for a, a, week, a week or two, we've, I've measured it and I've gotten an inch and a half increase out of the diameter, diameter of their rib cage because of this. 
That's how sympathetic and tight this tissue was. These are compensation patterns. Um, research has just came out. 90% of most Americans have a dysfunctional breathing pattern. What are they not doing? They're not belly breathing, basically. Belly breathing will push you in a more relaxed state, calm you down, um, and let me, uh, let me show you some of the crazy things that we have done with just the breathing alone. So for example, this athlete failed his running test for college athletics. This is, he ran 200s and you can see he was in the top two heart rate zones and he failed. Six days later, same athlete, same test, couldn't get in that much shape. It's impossible to get in that good of a shape. Okay, he was in his top two heart rate zones were in 83% of the time. Six days later, after six bouts of RPR, he is only in the third, he only spent heart rate zone was in the top two or top two heart rate zones 30% of the time. There's the compare. This is the same athlete doing the same test six days apart. This was before and after RPR of six days of implementing it on his own. People ask, well, so the, Cal, so Cal yeah. what are you saying is that you're doing a parasympathetic reset? Uh, with the breathing, it can be. Yes. Now, yeah. Yeah. now, but, but here's the thing, if you can, so my best athletes I've ever coached, when I watch them with all these heart rate variability devices and heart rate monitors, they all run hard on this 200. The best athletes can shift into a parasympathetic state, even if it's 20 seconds in between the next set, to be able to do it again. So you can see here, he was not able to shift down and recover, where six days later, he was. Okay, the best athletes can go from a sympathetic state. So you're basically helping turn off the sympathetic system. Yes, exactly. Overloaded, the sympathetic system is overloaded because of not only the breathing patterns, tension in the muscles, compensatory shifts, fascial stress yep. on the muscles themselves, which will affect the oxygenation, which will affect circulation. Yep. So what you're basically doing is trying to shut down the sympathetic and just basically reset the parasympathetic, correct? I, well, yes, from a, from a biological perspective and the human, that's what you want to do when the workout's over. I even want it to happen in between each set because then mm -hmm. each set, you can coach the athlete better. They actually, because cause the research has shown if you're in this heart, heart rate zone up here, you can't learn. You can barely function and you're, you're not going to be optimal at performance. If you can in between each set, calm yourself down. This athlete's going to learn and train and be able to be coached. This athlete is not. So you're, you're correct with everything you said. I even look at it as um, trainability. When this athlete, it probably took him three days to recover from this workout. Six days later, when he did the same workout, it probably took him a few hours to cut, recover from this workout. That's the biggest difference. So the amount of work an athlete can do, but, but look. Well, let me throw something else at you then. Yes, so, sir. Uh, I can't, did you disappear? Somebody hit something. Can you guys hear me? I'm actually, my internet oh, screwed up. Yeah, okay, there you go. Internet. You're back. I was going to say, um, can you guys hear me now? We're good. You're, we're good? Okay. I was going to say, if you're talking about survival, which you mentioned, the spine, the brain, which I agree 100%. So in between those areas there, are you not in effect trying to actually get the brain more into alpha mode? I mean, beta mode is they're constantly on. Alpha mode is the meditative state. So I'm, I'm assuming that, I'm assuming, this is just my assumption, yeah. that when... The meditative state, but also the state of more receptiveness, you know? 
That's yes. what I'm seeing. It, um, it, 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 it's I could a, be wrong. I don't, I think that's a good analogy. I think you're just in a more calm beta state and you're getting close to alpha and maybe, oh. maybe they do. Right. But I, I'm not sure. So for example, when one of my athletes come out of the squat rack and their heart rate's 200, but, and then uh -huh. 40 seconds later, uh, it was an Olympic caliber wrestler that I was dealing with. He was at 67 in 40 seconds. Mm -hmm. He can make decisions and you're right. You want them to be able to be in that control. Some of the elite military units that I've worked with, what they think separates the 1% of the 1%. We're talking, you're talking a class of 120 special forces soldiers try out for a special group and only three of those make it that are already, they're already Navy SEALs, Rangers, Green Berets, and only three to five make it. One of the things is that those people can run into a room, make all the right decisions, a door opens up, they run to the next room, make all the right decisions. And after seven or eight rooms, they remember what happens on the third shot of the fourth room. What color was the hat on that guy? And this is the calmness is that we're, we're talking about. Whether it's just cognition or trainability, this is the big factor, in my opinion, that separates some of the most elite people. They remain calm. And, and this will help, right? I'm not saying this is the only reason because the, the brain drives some of this. The physiology drives some of this. So it, it's not a one-way street, to say the least. But yes, you are exactly right. Um, you, you, I guess you see my point. So like, here's one of my HRVs that I did in 2014 even, and this is an Omega wave reading and sevens are best on this scale. This athlete's readiness wasn't very good. Sevens are best. So his, his fatigue, his stress was a little high. His fatigue index was high. Adaptive reserves your ability to your bodies to adapt to strenuous loads. And it was super low. His nervous system was he, his brain nervous system DC potential was terrible. De detoxification, horrible. He did his RPR. We checked him. Stress levels were extremely low. Fatigue down. Adaptive reserves increased. His brain was almost optimal. And I showed the Omega Wave people and they said, you can't change your test this fast. It's impossible. Oh, but over here, you can see the difference between the two tests. Here's the bad one. The parasympathetic system wasn't as activated. And then with the breathing, you can see that the, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to try to, I'm sorry. The parasympathetic, parasympathetic system was highly activated, actually almost too activated, right? That was because in this reading an hour before he was in a really bad state. Sympathetic system was somewhat activated. Now, and now the sympathetic system is actually decreased because the parasympathetic system. So, so just so, and everyone, this, this is what's important. The, the recovery system, not people, you can't look at these things individually. You do, but you can't because if the parasympathetic system's activated and the sympathetic system doesn't decrease, you have a problem. If the sympathetic is high also, then what you have is you have somebody that, is overtrained. They're trying to recover, but they're so sympathetic that they can't get out of that vicious cycle. So you saw he was a little sympathetic here, but the parasympathetic was deactivated. I had a feeling he was hung over and his body was trying to get over the hangover. And this is a professional athlete. And he was, once I got the test and after I checked everything, I asked him, were you hung over? And he was with some of these readings, right? So bottom line is, is, um, you know, and these are just some of my interactions between the the heart rate variability and the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. Um, um, this is a couple stories, to be honest with you. One, one, one thing I found an older adult, a buddy of mine asked me to check him. Parasympathetic system was super low. Sympathetic system, super low. And an 80 year old pretty much means that you're done because your body doesn't have the ability to recover and your body can't, doesn't have enough ability to, kick itself into gear to survive. And it was, it was literally a couple of weeks and his uh, father passed away after I checked him. So I, another guy was like, Hey, I'm, I just got this feeling. My, my, and he was actually a chiropractor. His dad, all of a sudden, all his flexors started like coming on. Right. So you go in the old folks home and you see all these people They're They're like, everything's 
coming forward is because the extensors are shut off. Your extensors are coordinated with the parasympathetic system. So the parasympathetic system shuts off and your extensor muscles also shut off. And when you don't have ability to respond to stress and your, your sympathetic system's worn out and you're old, I, I'll be honest with you, I'm pretty sure that you're on the, uh, you're on the last stretch of your life. Because I, I checked some 90 year olds and these things were balanced. These were very balanced. Okay. And, and you can see it when somebody starts to, their, their, their hands become more like even my pro uh, athletes, I've seen athletes overtrained and their hands, they walk around with their hands curled. That's because the extensor system parasympathetic shifted off and the sympathetic system ties into the flexors and they're, they're like this. And as a baby, you're like this, we spend our whole life trying to open up, get to extension. And then when it's basically over towards the end of life, you'll see people start to curl up. And that's when you know. Well, that's, a, that's the same thing with a person that's had um, a stroke. You're exactly the, right. The flexors take over. They're the strongest muscle groups in our bodies. Right. You know. But it's because that, that parasympathetic yep. system isn't working correctly. I think it's because the brain says, I've had some major trauma. I'm stressed out. And the flexors kick in. And the par eventually, the parasympathetic system wears out. Does that make sense? That's my thinking. Okay, um, I, I, I'm gonna, I'll share this all with a group. But again, the one thing that we saw was heart rate, we have to- Well, keep listen, to the other thing you gotta think about when somebody gets injured, what are they doing? You'll never see them in extension. When no. they get injured, they huddle in, they basically tuck in. So you're tucking into your body to protect yourself, you know? Yeah, and that's that sympathetic response. So if somebody takes a major oh. brain trauma, what they do is is they'll tuck in, oh they roll to the ground, and then they look up. At this point, the brain goes, I have to find the horizon so I can stabilize everything. And when you see them get up, you'll see them hunched over like this when they're, they're, everything's flexed in. And that's that's your survival mechanism kicking in to try to, to try to find out where you're at and your awareness. And with that being said, like the parasympathetic system is, is shut off. And then if they don't recover, you'll see if it's a really bad one. And, and I've, I've checked these people, that parasympathetic system is, is extremely uh, shut down. And again, you're right with the flexors. That's exactly what's going on. Um, these are all just, this is just basically the heart rate. The studies that they've done is, um, after 145 beats per minute, your heart rate starts to deteriorate. So when a coach runs a drill so repetitively and the athlete's heart rate's at 145, he's not doing any skill learning. If you can keep the athlete at a lower heart rate in here, that's when things can happen, okay? Good things happen, trainability. You get athlete up here, there's no trainability. You really lack in trainability, in my opinion, okay? Um, the biggest thing is that breathing, we recommend belly breathing. When you're doing RPR in your nose, out your mouth, the rest of the day, breathing through your nose, we've seen increases in hamstring flexibility and why the breathing is important because the diaphragm is, through fascia, connected to the psoas, okay? A friend of mine went to a, non-embalmed cadaver lab and could not separate them. So when you breathe correctly, your psoas becomes super strong, super activated. People go, how can a runner not have an, a psoas? Well, what happens is the quad kicks in and starts doing more hip flexion than it should, right? So if you're belly breathing, I've never seen one athlete not have their psoas activated when they're belly breathing, okay? With the, the upside down Y that you saw actually opens up the diaphragm and turns on the psoas. And yes, in RPR, we have a test, we isolate it. And what we do is, with that being said, we isolate it with a test and then we just do the breathing and it'll actually turn the psoas on. We don't even have, we have a psoas reset. You don't even have to do it because if the breathing's correct, this psoas is, is uh, then it actually lengthens itself. 
we have seen large amounts from Thomas test to many things where the psoas actually increases length. If you're chest breathing, oops, I'm sorry. If you're chest breathing, the psoas is not very in a very strong or good position anytime we've ever tested it. And if the psoas isn't working over days and weeks, the one thing it does is it, it actually locks down around T12 or um, is it T? No, it's L, right? No, what, what, what? Um, yeah, right around T12. I'm sorry. Um, the, uh, it locks down to protect the spine. If it can't do its hip flexor job, it locks down to protect the spine. The psoas main job is protect the spine and then flex the hip. If you can't flex your hip, you can't, you'll, you will die. You can't hunt for food. You can't make babies and the species will die. So it has ways to get around that. Okay. And that's why the quad dominant person comes into play. And that was one of the big things is that we actually fix that every day. It's a system of self care that we do. Okay. Um, couple other things. So the quad dominant problem, you get tendonitis of the knee. What happens with the quad dominant athlete is if the, if the knee, if the quad's main job is to do hip extent or uh, knee extension, but it also has to do hip flexion. What transpires is every, the quad starts to get tired and you get female sports where you're going, okay, this is an athlete that is done, runs around all the time, the quad gets tired, can't stabilize the knee, we find that they are ones that have ACL problems. So one year we had a, uh, a coach that was a little crazy in soccer. She had five ACL problems. Every one of those girls that after the ACL problem we checked, their psoas was not working correctly to say the least. So, and they all, these girls had these big juicy quads. And again, remember when I told about the track athletes where they had big juicy quads, but the second we got that shifted and their quad shrunk doing the same amount of training and their psoas was working, they ran faster and jumped higher on all of our testing and then their performance in running. So again, what you'll see is forged uh, posture of the shoulders, right? The ribs are pulled down lots of instability in running, but that lumbar spine becomes tight and these athletes will actually lock down their spine when you have a dysfunctional psoas not working. Um, I know I threw a lot at you on that. Are there any questions in regards to? I've got a question for you, Cal. Yes, sir. Um, I, was, um, I was actually talking to, I know Chris Corfus. Oh yeah, yep. and, good uh, friend we, of mine. We, we were actually, he was um, trying to bring me on to the benefits of RPL with speed, actually. And they, they, yeah, there he is without yeah, his guitars. Um, so I was just wondering, when you were talking about um, Arch, Glute Mead, QL, other side, when you, if you keep going up the chain, have you noticed an issue, upper body, causing lower body issues with speed athletes? Are they ipsilateral or are they contralateral? Um, I'm going to look for, uh, I'm gonna, let me see if I have a slide here. So basically, I would like to wish it only happened one way, but I, I don't think it does. Let me give you this example. Cool. So let me, let me walk you through my, the train of, of uh, so when that arch collapses, so when this arch collapses when we run, what transpires is, um, I don't know if I have a good slide. What happens, like I said before, the hip, so when this arch collapses, the brain goes, I can't stabilize. So the hip, the same side hip starts to lock down and then it sneaks over to the contralateral QL to stabilize and everything locks down there. Well, then it'll have to cross back over and, and actually that contralateral QL is tied to the lat. So for example, when somebody's running and that arch falls at the foot strike when the arch collapses, what they'll do to stabilize their midsection is to compensate by swinging that arm out. But it's the same arm? It would be the contralateral arm. It's the contralateral, okay. Yeah, because if I'm... Yeah, it's... 
Right over my court. So if I'm in the running position and this leg is up, right, and mm -hmm. this leg's on the ground, it wouldn't be – this one's the up one. It would be mm -hmm. knee to knee, I'm sorry. But yep. just for that. And this, this arm, because this foot's on the ground and that foot can't stabilize, what you'll see in many runners is this arm sneaks out. Right. And it can be because this lat's off. It's not working correctly. But when you track it down, it goes to that arch. Yep. In my athletes, and this is, I, I would say it's about 80% of the time. Now, it also sneaks over to that opposite shoulder. So can the upper body cause the problem? I think in a pain, so follow me here. I had one of my athletes who, who and my, my hockey players have strong feet things. We do these spring ankle exercises, which, which Chris came up with, which I'll, I'll send you guys. They, um, they build the arch up so that when it hits the ground, it is actually a spring and an arch. Um, and, and it just re, what it does is if your hips and knees are so strong and that arch can't stabilize, your brain will actually shut down how much power your feet can produce or so your body will, will permit it to produce because if, if it, your body won't break itself. Okay. So my athletes are very strong in their arches. We've been do, doing this stuff for two years. I had an, and here's the example I'm going to give you. I had an athlete take a stick right in the hip flexor, right in the hip pointer. Okay. There was so much pain there that it buckled him over. He vomited. And this was in a hockey game. The next day he came in and we we're going to try to see if we gave him to play. And I don't, I didn't think he could, but I knew that his, everything was shut off in his hip. I checked his ab abductum strength. Everything was shut off. I went to the arch and did a strength test on it and he failed miserably. And I'm telling you the Wednesday before this happened, it happened on a Saturday. He was so strong. I had personally did his strength work and he felt like a rock. So my point is, is I, I would like to think that it's a, it's a one way street, but, but there's no possible way. If a hip flexor and an injury in the upper body can shut down things along that train chain so that the arch is so weak, even though the pain's not there, it tells me that we got a pretty dynamic system that we can never honestly say that it's just one thing causing the problem does that make sense no sure I, I was just wondering if you were seeing like typically uh, things above the chain ql are they are they more contralateral for the opposite foot yeah so it yeah. always it yeah. crosses it yeah i'm sorry yeah no, um, no cool no, yeah, yeah and a, I, really I just helpful wanted, example though yeah it, yeah it, it, and uh always when it comes up to that foot once it hits the hip it crosses over and seems to be contralateral at least for the midsection in the thoracic spine. And then remember, some of the shoulder problems can cross back over. So, but, but again, that's just in some stability. When you run, it's that opposite side arm that swings out. So then, here's the beauty of the RPR. In my opinion, when I, because I've had world-class track coaches bring some athletes here, and I don't try to coach them because that's not my, I send my, my video of my son running to Chris and then he, he, uh, he critiques it. I, I mean, I'm getting way better at it, but my point is, is this coach is telling one of their athletes, he has one arm that sticks out when he runs down the track. Okay. Every time he has to tell him to hold his arm in, but that arm is a problem from one of his feet. So you're actually telling a kid to do something that the body knows better not to do. It needs that arm out for stability. So then I show him the hip reset, the arch reset, and the lat, opposite side lat, where that arm's sticking out. And we, I told him, don't coach the kid. And what did the kid do when he ran down the track? He held his arm in. So when people see my workouts, I do not, like, I'm not in this for speed for running. I'm in this for speed for for hockey nowadays because that's my main sport so i don't coach athletes into a position that i know there might be something wrong i try to fix the problem so they naturally do the things that i want because 
these, these compensation patterns, if you're a coach and you got an athlete that has to run like this with his arms out, well, there's a problem somewhere. Let's try to fix the problem through exercise or RPR so that he just runs naturally because the way to run is wired in there somewhere. We're just trying to coach you to that when, when our body's responding to something in there that, that might not be working correctly. Okay. And then the question becomes, well, what if I fix it and he still runs like this? Well, then you might need to coach him in. But my goal is to not coach anybody is just to have them move correctly all the time without coaching them. Because if they got to run down a track and think, okay, I got to hold my arm in. I got to push this. I got to do that. That doesn't work. They just need to run. They just need to run. In my opinion, I think I'll be honest with you. When I go visit coaches all over the world, kids and people are trying to make their name. They, they coach all the time and they give too many people too many coaching points. They just, they, it never works. I think you got to like, you got to, and I have many examples where I did experiments and, and bottom line is you give them more than one or two points. You have lost them. They're going to stop running fast and moving fast. And that's my number one objective in, in my opinion. So. So I take it, Cal, under no circumstances, if you can identify the collapse in arch, you'd ever put an orthotic or an arch support in the shoe? I would say in most cases, no. I mean, I'm sure there's some, but, um, and look, people say, well, I got flat feet. Um, I've seen world-class sprinters with flat feet, right? As yeah. long as that foot is strong. And let me, let me show you these positions. Um, uh, let me show you these positions. I have them right here. So, so these positions, these are the, uh, this is a position. Basically we stand in this position. These are the, 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 the three positions. We got a deep squat on a single foot, right? We'll do it and we'll do that deep squat in two positions. As low as you can get your heel in a deep position and as high as you can get your heel. Mm -hmm. And I'll send you guys the videos actually. And I don't know how well it'll play here. I'm going to give it a shot because it might be a little, and I'll send you direct links to YouTube so you guys can see this. So basically my athlete, I don't know if it's playing well Working over the, yes, yeah, okay, good, good, good. So he gets in there and basically he gets his heels down as far as he can. And then he gets into a deep squat position and then he pulls one leg out and he'll hold that. Now, when I do this, uh, I'm sorry. I got to move this thing here. I can't, I can't pause it. Maybe if I just hold it. Okay. When he's doing this, this is like level one where he's doing it 60 seconds. My athletes, I have a 130 pound female that will get in this position and I will put all 250 pounds of my weight and I try to break her for 10 seconds and she can hold this position. And I'm telling you, I never have coached her on running this last summer and she looked like an absolute machine because in my opinion, our weak, our feet are so weak because of the shoes and we don't walk around the way we're supposed to that if you strengthen that foot, it will help with many, many problems. And this is the same drill that I'm talking about where athletes get their feet strong and then their back loosens up because wow. now they have stability every step. Okay. Um, that's just, there's, there's five of these positions. The other position would be that your ankle's super high. Um, let me go to the next one. I think this okay. one's it. Yeah. Cal, position two. Yes. Cal, let me break in for a second. The one, um, I had a, a high school kid years ago and everybody told him, no, he can't take his shoes off. He has to wear the arse for that. And all that did was continue to make it weak. And he went ahead and we did a lot of grass drills, a lot of walking, walking in sand, some stabilized like st yeah. static things like that not the same ones those are great right and he got better and he's like i really enjoy running but i feel great it doesn't hurt anymore and he ran right. faster but second thing <laughs> oh, just, oh wait a minute <laughs> well that's that's it. the problem is you get this thing no i'm not allowed my doctor my podiatrist they won't let me do that um <clears throat> second thing is i apologize i gotta get going i just got some stuff and i've got to get ready to get it to kids i made tim the actual host so I'm just going to leave, okay. Tim. When you click end meeting, it'll end the recording. So you all have fun. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, Rich. And, and everybody, remember, this, this is in the speed manual that you guys were sent. This was the main, pro, this is the main thing in those speed manuals that, 
that uh, I sent for free if everybody didn't get the codes. Um, and if, if you guys have a staff or people you want to share more with, just hit me up in an email. I've sold tens of thousands of things. It's like, I don't need to sell anymore. I'm not here to, right. I'm going to, I'll produce another major book here. I'll sell a bunch of those. Like, I'm not worried about that. Um, here's the second position. It's the same deep squat, but you can see that his ankles in a high position. Okay. And there's basically five of these positions and it's basically a, two ankle positions, a low and a high, and then just your different squat levels. And folks, I've sold probably 10,000 of these manuals and I have gotten emails every day since we started selling them on the changes that people have because of their feet week. And, and look here, I'm going to tie this in every one of my, and, and look, I've coached 200 seasons of teams. Every freak human I had had super strong feet, which you know what is tied to their butt, the size of their ass if they have strong feet increases the size of their ass and all my freak athletes had unbelievable large butts, right? Mm -hmm. They had strong feet. And then what happens? I, I'll take an athlete who break a foot or take a puck in the, the foot. What happens to that glute over the next three weeks? It shrinks. It shrinks because they're not using their foot. It's in a boot. So my world-class athletes, have all and they don't have to have big feet no i've had some world-class shot putters yeah the kid was six four jumped 44 inch vertical and you're going okay he had size 15 shoes his feet were so strong he ran a 4 4 40 yard dash didn't run and his glutes were monstrous that i mean there's a guarantee there but even kids with even my females with small feet with nice big glutes we check the strength of the foot and it's super strong Okay. And, and here's the thing, um, real quick. I mean, physical therapists reach out, Hey, I did your stuff. We do a lot of foot stuff. I don't know if I need to implement them, but yet they bring their athletes in. And if they haven't done these exercises, these are extremely stressful. Their athletes fold. Why rehab is never enough stress in the foot. If a world-class sprinter sprints, there might be eight to 900 pounds of force in a split second coming down on the ground and that foot has to stabilize does squeezing a little towel in rehab you, you think that mimics the force like i i don't know what they're thinking i'll be honest with you i mean it drives me nuts it drives me crazy and we forget that the, the principle of adaption is actually applying stress i mean it's crazy to me so again um i'm not gonna go through all these positions because you guys have them in that speed manual that that you can get but that's that that's the key factor and importance in, in most of that uh in regards to how this all ties together especially with the foot and then i will also um if everybody i think everybody was on there i will also give everyone the, the rpr course if they want okay the online one yeah i'll uh, i'll get that to you guys and if you like it just tell people about it um use your, um, you know, tell your athletes about it in regards, no, tell your athletes not to buy it because we're coming out with an athlete version. that's like 40 bucks. Of course I'll send everybody to $300. Okay. So don't have your athletes buy it. Right. The, the, the short version's coming out for $40. So, um, any questions on that? Cause, um, I don't know how long you guys want to go. I have about 40 hours of, of slides we can go through. So it's up to you guys. I can do one more. I, I can do one or two more, whatever you guys want. I can make one more of my most advanced training tool I got that I've found. It's up to you guys. All right. I think we're loving this and yeah, uh, cool, yeah. we'll probably stay on as long as we can. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So look, um, one of the things that I've done over the years that drives me crazy is I question everything I've ever done, right? Even though I create something that's good, I question how can I make it better? Uh, and, and basically, here's my formula for making things better. And I, I've only shared small amounts of things, but I basically, uh, I question everything I do, which creates problems I didn't know I had. And then I try to make solutions, okay? So making solutions is what I'm good at. 
So what I did was I knew, I've known for 20 years, periodization's flawed. The way we periodize, it's flawed. Um, and here's the thing, I'll jump maybe ahead once. I have a tool that I created and it's really a 20 yard dash test. You take a 10 yard splint, a uh, split of that 10, of the 20, I'm sorry. You take the 10 split, put in body weight and height. And I have a website that you put that in. And basically what happens is it will give you, it will give you whether an athlete needs to train strength, power, or speed. So an athlete runs his time. So for example, when I say that, I have, let's say I just have a, two athletes that ran a 20 yard dash at 2.7 seconds. They both ran a 20 yard dash. One runs a 1.6, 10 split. The other one runs a 1.57. They are on completely different training programs. So this is a rate limiter tool. This identifies the weakest link in each one of these athletes and tells you what quality they need, whether they need strength, power, or speed. And when I say that, speed's like 20 to 50% load. So instead of doing, so if you needed strength, you might do 80, 90% load in your training, moving the bar slow to make your 20 faster. This athlete might be doing 25% load, which means he's probably doing squat jumps instead. You can do the same exercise but you're just doing a super load and doing squat jumps instead of squats might be your prescription. And here's, here's the sad thing. And, and look, I'm, a, I knew it was wrong, but I had no answers for it. That periodization was flawed. So what I did was I took athletes every two weeks. I have them run a 20 yard dash and it tells me what quality they need to do. So my athletes all run on, on Monday morning, a 20. They, I have athletes that have ran the same time and their friend is doing a different program. And it kind of gets them a little buy-in. So when I say this, that they ran their 20 meter dash or 20 yards, 20 meters, either or, and I laid out their whole summer. And this, this wasn't me laying it out. This was their body telling me what I needed to do the next two weeks. And I kept track of everything. Only 20% of the athletes followed the normal periodization models that every organization does. I have an entire video on this. I'm not kidding you. I have only been right. Don't tell my ex-wife this, but I've only been right 20% of the time. <laughs> All right. I'm not kidding. <laughs> and, uh, and she probably would agree with that. Maybe a little less, but, and she's an amazing person. Here's the thing. The periodization models that we use, I'm talking to every organization, NSCA, track and field, the typical periodization only worked optimally for 20% of my athletes. That was, I had 50 that last summer. I had coaches that checked over 200 of their athletes that use this tool. Only 20% of the people followed the, the basic periodization models. If we took that periodization model and flipped it backwards, we would have got it more right for people. So, and then the other 50% of people just did a mixture. Like they do strength and then they do speed and they go back to strength. They didn't follow any plan that, that we know of, but it was their plan. And again, this just, you train power for two weeks. And then when you run your test, you may get another power reading for the next two weeks. Or you may get a speed reading or you may get a strength reading. And here's like, I'm, I'm going to tell you like this much here. So these two athletes, this athlete runs a 157 and is 10 compared to this one. This athlete needs more strength or uh, needs more, uh, uh, he would need more speed, okay? Because his strength with his body weight is excellent. This athlete needs more strength. Now I even have a five yard split in there. The five yard split that I use now on that, that website, if you want to plug in a five yard split, 
tells me if you need isometric strength. So when you do your squats, have been correlated to starting strength, isometric has, which tells me exactly what the athlete's strength deficit is. So, and then I've also hacked into, if you throw a pro agility time with this, it will tell you if you need eccentric strength. Because here's, here's how I got all these numbers. I was able to test kids for 20 years. I did 20 and a 10 yard split. I did pro agilities. I did back squat, bench, power cleans, vertical jump, pause vertical jumps. And I was able to come up with formulas that told me if an athlete needed to get stronger or athlete needed to get faster with flying tens, everything. And I was able to boil it down with some scientific help that this 20 yard dash and this 10 yard split time can tell me what those athletes needed. So I'm talking, I had athletes 20 years ago that I progressed through my programs. And I ran their numbers through here and it showed when they got strong enough, I didn't need to work strength anymore when they were this strong, according to these formulas. So it was 20 years of numbers. Thank God I kept them or I wouldn't have been able to figure this out of thousands of tests on athletes that was able to help me use this prediction tool. Um, I'll send you guys this slide so that you can uh, take a look at it. But again, if uh, I use, I use 1080, so I, I actually did this for them, but you can see here, athlete one, they may be the same athlete or not. They may run the same times, but a young athlete might need strength for two weeks, power, speed, and then back to power. Old athlete might be more speed stuff in the weight room, power, strength, and then speed. My point is, is I test in two week blocks and here's the deal. Everything I've tested with advanced athletes, after two weeks, if he did a power block, I can't get any more return of benefits out of the power block after two weeks. Maybe three. Now, young athletes, you can do power for weeks on end and get better. But my more advanced athletes, for whatever reason, two weeks has been the bang for your buck. And then what I'll do is I'll retest on that 20 yard dash. And if it tells me power again, then I do it again because they're still lacking the quality, but then eventually they get out of the power now. And here's the beauty of it. Some athletes leave power and I, I would predict they should go to strength, but some don't, but, but what is this? This is just telling me how they respond in their genetics or what quality do they lose first? Like I have, I have females that'll lose strength so fast where my males, they don't seem to move, lose strength as fast. So they'll come out of power and almost always have to hit speed where my females will lose strength more often. But, but I'm going to tell you this much, my females actually retain power. So once we go from power with my female to strength, they always follow up with a few speed sessions. Okay. And speed is premium in my opinion. I will have, I have athletes, especially a strong female. She'll stay in speed four to six weeks sometimes before I even switch her out of it. And actually the speed stuff that I do is, um, is in a, I, I think it's the peaking manual I sent you guys. There's a peaking manual that's uh, with a code that you can get. It's all my speed stuff. And when I say that, uh, let me look here real quick. Uh, I will... I'll give you one example of my speed stuff, like an exercise. Here we go. Um, let me exit here. And this is, this is pretty, this is some pretty, uh, let me see. Um, let's see. Uh, Uh, you'll, you'll see, uh, that's, that's not my tube. Hold on. There it is. Yeah. So like this one, are you guys able to see that video? Yeah. So this thing. So this is just a single leg one, which is more power. 
but at the speed at which thing happens, there's not a hamstring machine in the gym that simulates that movement, right? So I have, and if you do it double leg, let me uh, go back, see if I can get the double leg one. Um, oh yeah, here's this. Watch how fast this is. And you get a world-class sprinter on there, it is scary how fast they're being. So I, I'll go from a reverse hyper to a glued ham to this, in my opinion, is how you move in sports. And I, in the peaking manual, I actually have a, a graph on TMGs. It's a tensile mile graph that it indicated how much this improved the speed at which the muscle contracts. This exercise for hamstring and glutes. So I'll do, I have 450 versions of this exercise. Uh, this is actually, yeah, co-contraction. So this one's for hip flexors. So you can see that. Like what exercise in the gym stimul simulates the speed at which a hip flexor? Here's another one for the glute that I really like. Teaching the glute to fire. And look, so just so you're clear on this, I have a band up top and a band at the bottom. What the bands do is they facilitate the speed at which the muscle contracts and relax. And when I say that, it's in my peaking manual. The Soviets found the most advanced athletes in the world and their world champions. The muscles relaxed faster than anybody else. We're talking about guys that just missed the world team. Honestly, the speed at which your muscle contracts is not much different between a, world, uh, um, a couch potato and a world-class athlete. It's not significant. But when you look at the relaxation speed, that's what's the big difference because they can refire those muscles quicker then, okay? This co-contraction stuff, and, and look, I'm, um, let me go back. I'll just, I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. Even if you look at the, uh, like this one, this one's pretty, if you guys look at this, Again, this is my peaking manual, but this is the speed at which his shoulder should contract. You, you can't believe how hard, it doesn't look hard, but you can see his torso trying to stabilize the whole time just by doing one movement overhead. And, and this actually causes stability all the way through the, sp through the spine. The EMGs, these type of ballistic movements were greater I think this one's a pretty good one to show you how fast. So we did a shoulder press with EMGs on, muscle activation, max effort. He actually activated his muscles more doing it this way with the bands at high speeds and high velocities. In my opinion, folks, these 450 exercises, and I, I've, I've used this in my peaking my athletes for world team camps, blah, blah, blah. They all tested excellent using this type of training. And let's be honest, it's just a different type of training, but it's high speeds. So is it, is it that the high speeds are more optimal? Here's what I, I know this for a fact. I can't answer that question. I can tell you this. If you're straining, your nervous system switches over to being a straining nervous system and not a repetitive, fast-moving nervous system. So I just think not moving heavy weight all the time is a good thing when you're trying to peak and that's the only way that I've, I've ever gotten great results and using these exercises is better than moving heavy weight. And I actually find my athletes don't necessarily lose a lot of strength for four to six weeks after doing these exercises. Again, that's in the peaking manual that I sent you guys. So I know I threw a lot at you on that one, but there's 450 exercises that I do and you can see it's pretty crazy. And I, and I actually change these bands up through a different, different set of contractions. Like even this one, this one's not, like that cramps my hamstring. I can barely do it. I'm just gonna be honest, it cramps my hamstring instantly, but I'm 46 years old. So I really don't need to move that fast, do I? I mean, not really. If you see me moving that fast, something's gone really wrong and everybody should run. You know what I'm saying? So but you can see all these uh, positions. 
And that's just a one pound dumbbell. And look, you don't even need a dumbbell. You can use your hands. But a one pound dumbbell, when this, when this band shoots that dumbbell back to separate the muscles that are contraction, you can watch your athletes, their muscles are exploding right here in the rear delt just to stabilize and reverse that. So what is this? These are all just plyometrics for the weight room. That's all they are. So when you're doing more plyometrics, this is what you should be doing. Now, again, I found I like to get great results for two weeks, but many times when I peak an athlete for an Olympic or world team trials or to make a team, I have even found six weeks of these types of exercises are very effective. So if you're in the track and field realm, I always learned about four to six weeks out, I pulled squats and went to um, training of squats and went to high speed stuff. This is the kind of stuff, especially those hamstring kicks, those hip extensions. Now people say, well, my athletes like to do heavy squats and they feel good. They feel good because they get a hormonal response. So have them do one or two reps of a heavy movement, but then do a majority of their movements with these types of movements in their program. Okay. I'm not going to dis disclaim that doing some heavy weights are benefit. And it's really what I found. It's only a hormonal benefit that this works well, but you know, ultimately, um, I think the best thing that we can do is, is um, take a look at this peaking method for our athletes. Because again, it's less of an irritant if it's not mimicking the speed at which everything happens. But, but folks, the speed at which things happen on the, the court or in the track and field world are crazy. And we don't do anything like that in the weight room. I'll just be honest with you. That's always been my concern. Any questions, hey guys? Yeah, yeah. Guys, pardon. Even though I made him host and I left, it just told me I can't open my meeting with my team until this one's ended. Okay. I apologize. I got to end it now. That's the way this stupid system works. So, well, Sorry. hey, we'll wow. end this. We loved having you on. This was awesome. Thank All you. right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks, Kyle. Wow, that was brilliant. Well, look through some of those those uh, things, and then I'll uh, send an RPR for you guys. Thanks, and then, uh, yeah, and then we'll, we can always circle back at some other time when you have more questions. And I'm, I may try to jump in these. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. Thanks, for your time. Yeah, bye -bye. Thanks a million. That was fantastic. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Enjoy you guys. Bye. Thank you very much.